just start by reminding everybody of who Henry Wallace was and how he fits into, I guess, two parts. Who was Henry Wallace and how does he fit into an actual American progressive tradition? That is a a very good set of questions. Um, And the best way to begin is to say that Henry Wallace was a farmer. Um, He was born in a a very rural part of Iowa, Orient Township in Adair County, um, and grew up in a farm family. Uh, His uh, family not only farmed on the ground, but they also were active in agricultural activism and editing a farm paper. And that's how he came to be known. Their paper was called Wallace's Farmer, and he was its editor. It was a progressive Republican uh, tradition that he came out of. He split with the Republicans often. And in 1932, um, in the most important split with the Republicans for him, uh, he met a young candidate for president, a guy who's just a couple years uh, older than him, Franklin Roosevelt, um, who asked for his support. Wallace gave that support. And then entered the New Deal administration uh, in March of 1933 as part of the first wave. He was one of Roosevelt's first appointees as Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, People today may have a hard time wrapping their heads around it, but at that time, the Department of Agriculture was the dynamic force of the New Deal. It was where rural electrification and farm and food programs, but also so many employment programs, so much of the innovation came from there. And he so impressed progressives across the country, labor, farm, uh, rural, urban folks, uh, as well as activists on behalf of social and racial justice with his focus, his approach, that he became a very popular figure on the left in the party. And in 1940, Franklin Roosevelt uh, pushed aside his Southern segregationist uh, vice president and brought Wallace onto the ticket at a point where the party really pivoted to the left. And Wallace fought very, very hard um, to keep the Democratic Party as a progressive party. Um, And we'll talk more about the brutal fights that went on from there. Um, But at at the heart of the matter, uh, it's best to say that in 1943, 1944, uh, I believe it was the Washington Post, other publications would say, that Henry Wallace almost single-handedly is keeping the flame of the New Deal lit um, and and keeping, shoring up Franklin Roosevelt. I mean, it was Roosevelt's vision and and Roosevelt gets the credit here, but at a point during World War II when um, so much of the energy was pulled toward the necessary war against global fascism, uh, it was Henry Wallace who was saying, yes, we can win this war and then we need to come home And we have to fight against Americanized fascism, which is division on the basis of race, gender, class. So he was a remarkable figure um, who has now been largely written out of our history. Why has he been written out of our history? (laughs) That's the uh, that's the great question. Um, He flew too close to the sun. Uh, He tried really, really hard to bring American politics from the 19th century to the 21st century. And uh, he tried to do it in a matter of two or three years and uh, eventually became enormously popular. This is 1942, 1943, 1944, enormously popular with working class folks, enormously popular uh, with a a really intersectional broad based coalition. Um, And uh, so the power in the party, the bankers, the Southern segregationists, the big city bosses really determined that he had to be stopped. And they threw all of their energy in the spring and summer of 1944 into knocking him off the ticket. Now, Franklin Roosevelt uh, said before the 1944 Democratic National Convention that um, if he was a delegate, he would have voted for Henry Wallace. Uh, But he said it with a softness because it was the midst of a war. He did not want the party. He did not want to, he wanted to hold the party together. And because of the divisions within it, he let party leaders uh, push Wallace aside. Um, they brought in Harry Truman, who many people have high regard for, but Truman was a much more centrist, much more cautious figure. And Wallace chose to fight on. He fought on at Roosevelt's side. Roosevelt brought him back into the administration, secretary of commerce. 
Uh, Roosevelt and Wallace had a plan for the post-war fight to create 60 million new jobs to uh, assure that you could keep the women who had gone into the workforce working to assure that African-Americans who had integrated defense industries would keep jobs and would transition into new jobs and to bring returning vets into jobs. It was a visionary plan. It went along with a housing plan. But the fact of the matter is um, he was pushed out of the Truman administration. He then chose to battle Truman in 1948, uh, seeking, running a popular front candidacy that had backing from socialists, radicals, communists, uh, some union folks, many early civil rights campaigners, but was quickly marginalized by the media um, and by the political elites of his time and really pushed out of politics. So he spent the last 15 years of his life back on the farm. Uh, and in many ways, he chose uh, to step away. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, the histories uh, quickly wrote him out. And I think the truth of the matter, Michael, is he was written out because he was inconvenient. Um, here was a guy who said in 1943, racism was Americanized fascism. Here was a guy who said in 1944, we have to pass the Equal Rights Amendment immediately because women are coming into the workforce and we've got to protect their position. Here was a guy who said, bluntly, I'm, I fight for the working man, the working woman, not for the masters of capital. Right. So and that, convenient I, to have that in yeah, history. Because, that's very, to be, and that that person ascended to the vice presidency and was, you know, for a period of time, the obvious successor to the most popular president and most successful president of the 20th century. Yeah, that's inconvenient. So, 